Uh, good morning, and I'd like to have you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Here we are in the second chapter. Thank you, Mike. That was excellent. And uh, you should have done uh, more, more poorly because now, now I'm going to have to have you come and speak on some, <laughs> some Sunday. You know, Trent in Bible Fellowship covered for me, and Trent was awesome. So, man, yeah, give Trent a big hand. You know, I don't, you, you guys just worked me out of a job. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm <laughs> What's that? Get off the stage. Okay. Running. Running from God. No. All right. Let's see. We got the text up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. And we're in this amazing series called Partnering, Partnering Together for the Gospel, the book of Philippians. That's the theme that we've given to the book of Philippians, partnering. They were partners with Paul in the gospel. They were, they were uh, lovingly and generously supporting Paul. The book's written 12 years since Paul's been with the people of Philippi. He's in house arrest in Rome. And yet their love is still great for one another. Their concern, their gratitude, it's there. And it's brought them both great joy. And they've, they, Paul said, there's not been one church that supported you that's, I'm sorry, that supported me like you have. Wow, that's, that's some powerful words. So we're going to start here in chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And it says there in Philippians 2, 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jerry Manuel, Jerry Manuel was the fourth most winning manager the Chicago White Sox had ever had. In 2000, he was named the American League Manager of the Year. Now, I love the White Sox because the White Sox, now I love the Rangers more because I've been living here 40 years <laughs> in Texas, but I grew up on the White Sox. They were my favorite Chicago baseball team. My uncles were Cubs fans. My dad and I were White Sox fans on the south side. And uh, so I have a special affinity for the White Sox. And by the way, I was there in 1970, 1976, I think it was, at the disco record demolition. <laughs> There was a radio station in Chicago that disliked disco music so, so much that they let people into White Sox Park, I think, for a dollar that night. If you brought a, a disco album and a, a, a dollar, you know, in fact, I think it was free. I think you got in free. But nonetheless, there were like 30,000 disco albums in, that they put in the park at the seventh inning stretch and they were going to explode them with dynamite. 
And so, and, and you could go to YouTube to see this. Don't do it right now, okay? But nonetheless, I was at the park that night, and, and when they exploded the disco records and they went in every which direction, they disintegrated them. Um, um, they dug a hole so big in the field that the game had to get postponed. <laughs> It blew a hole. I mean, it was unbelievable. But, well, we just had so much fun. But anyway, uh, yeah, I love the White Sox. And uh, anyway, uh, Jerry Manuel, he loved the White Sox. On Sunday, September 28th, 2003, this is amazing. The 49-year-old manager recorded his 500th victory in six seasons. Think about that. Think about how many wins that is out of 162. That's like, that's like pushing like 90 wins per season. That's a lot of wins for a baseball team. Now, the very next day, that was on September 28, 2003, the very next day, Jerry Manuel was fired. <laughs> he won 500 games in six years, but he was fired by the White Sox. Why? Because he didn't get the White Sox into the playoffs that year. They, they fired him from his job. Now, what's really cool is Manuel was and is a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves the Lord. He had been alerted to his firing a few days before it was made public. So in response to the news people of his dismissal, this is what the soft-spoken manager had to say. He said, when I came here, I came here to be a servant and not a celebrity. Obviously, that's changed. In other words, I've lost my job. I can't be a servant anymore. But that's still how I feel, and I don't have any regrets. He went on to add at that same news conference, obviously, you want to win, but if you can impact somebody's life and headed in the right direction. I think that's the biggest thing for me. I think that's the biggest thing for me. And you know what? Even though at that time in history, 20-some years ago, Jerry Manuel was one of the most famous and most popular uh, baseball managers in the world. I mean, he was world-renowned. As a believer in Christ, he, understand, he understood that his life, his life didn't revolve around fame and celebrity, the kind of car he drove, the kind of house he lived in, whether he's becoming more and more famous in the eyes of people all around him, more admired. That's not what mattered to Jerry Manuel. As the coach of the White Sox, he wanted to be a servant and not a celebrity. And you know what's interesting? In our text today, in Philippians 2, 1 through 11, Paul's reminding God's people of this very thing. He's pointing them in Jesus' direction. He wants them to be servants, and he's pointing them in Jesus' direction. He's telling them, think as a believer in Jesus, like Jesus thought. Think like he thought. Uh, the greatest person, the greatest person is the servant of all. And it's on this very topic that I want to speak this morning. And the title that I've given this morning is this, Becoming the Servants God Wants Us to Be. Becoming not the celebrities, not the admired, not the famous, not the... Uh, the great ones in the eyes of humanity, but the servants that God wants us to be. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into the text. Father, we praise you today for this Lord's Day, for this Lord's Supper Sunday, for this first day of the week, Lord, that we can put you first, Lord, in our week, in our lives, and we can listen to you. And Lord, I'm just your conduit for your word, what you have said. And so, Lord, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will use me 
and that you'll speak to the hearts of your people, both here and those who are streaming with us. Lord, be glorified. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It was Kirby John Caldwell, Kirby John Caldwell, who said the following, There are two great moments in a person's life. The moment you were born and the moment you realize why you were born. <laughs> you know, when each of us were born again spiritually, and of course being born again isn't, isn't promising God that you're going to honor him and glorify him or anything like that. Being born again is recognizing that you could never do enough good works to merit eternal life. Being born again is realizing I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, but Jesus, you've died for me, and I put my faith in you and you alone for the gift of eternal life. I trust in you for your amazing, amazing gift. And so when we were born again spiritually and we believe the saving message of Christ, not one of us most likely understood that we were born to serve. Okay, this is something you learn later. It's just like having a child. When that child's born, they don't learn immediately because they're not old enough, but eventually they mature and they find out, hey, here's why I'm on this earth. And that's, parents, what you teach your children. Why are you here? Why are you here? Here's why. This is why God put you on this earth. And so, um, Paul tells God's people, you get to the end of Philippians 1, and Paul tells God's people in verse 29, this has been given to you. Remember I told you that word granted, given is the word where we get our word grace from? <laughs> A Greek reader would pick it out right away. But we don't usually say, it's been graced to you. So we say given or granted, but it's graced. God, by his grace, gave us the wonderful opportunity to believe in Jesus. But not only that, he's given us the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to, ta-da, suffer for his sake. You say, say what? <laughs> I don't like suffering. But you know what? You, you will be able to take suffering in a much more godly way, less complaining, less griping, if you say, Lord, you've allowed this suffering of this kind to come into my life. You just name it. Whatever way that suffering, uh, whatever way that suffering takes in your life, you can say, Lord, you allowed this, and I'm happy to endure this for you. It takes time to get there because <laughs> we're big complainers. But you know what? How glorious it is where, um, you know, Jamie, back when Kelly and I were on our 40th wedding anniversary vacation, Jamie stood up here and he shared James 1. I was sitting in, in uh, let's see, it was in Henderson, Nevada, and, and, and we were taking in that message live on our uh, I guess it was on my iPad I had it, man. Nice, clear as day. It was awesome. But anyway, Jamie did such a great job, and he told us about uh, count it all joy when you fall into different types of tests from God. Count it all joy. Why? Because God's got your back. He's doing this for a purpose in your life, and that's to take you from here to here spiritually. He wants you to grow strong in him. In fact, he's doing it because he wants to make you an enduring Christian. All right. So we saw last week at the end of Philippians 1, Paul tells God's people that God gave them the privilege not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for his sake, to walk in his steps, to lay down their lives in service to other people. The people that are around you day after day, week after week, month after month, or the people that God suddenly, like, Dan spoke of earlier that suddenly God brings into your life, okay? And immediately, when you're done reading chapter 1, you see that word right there, therefore, 
Right after chapter 1, verses 29 and 30 are finished, Paul says, therefore. So what he's doing here in our text today is he's taking chapter 1. Hey, we're partners together in the gospel. And yes, we're going to suffer for that gospel. We're going to suffer for taking a stand for Jesus and giving his word out to others. Sometimes people aren't going to like it. Sometimes people are going to reject you. Sometimes they might mock you, whatever. But nonetheless, he says, you've, you've been gifted to suffer this way, therefore. Okay, think of him talking to the entire church family, the Philippians. And he says, therefore, church in Philippi, the first lesson I want you to get out of two today before we share the Lord's table is this. I want you to notice a picture that Paul's painting, a picture of the servant God wants you and I to be, a beautiful picture he paints for us. In verses 1 through 4, he's saying to this local flock of believers, he's saying, therefore, if... There's any, notice all these ifs. Notice, since you've been given the opportunity to suffer for Christ's sake, if there's any consolation in Christ, any encouragement, by the way, really a better word here would have been since. He's talking to save people. Let me just say that. Let me just put since in there. If, uh, since you've been given the opportunity to suffer for Christ's sake, since there is encouragement in Christ... And since there's comfort from the Father and his love, and since there, there, I think that's implied there, the Father, because we have the Trinity here, this, we have encouragement from Christ, we have the Father's comforting love, uh, we have, since we have fellowship in the Spirit, he indwells us. Since there is affection and mercies that we can have with one another, look what Paul says. Paul says this. Nope, oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Paul says this, verse 2, Since these things are true of all of you, fulfill my joy. Fill it to the full. You've given me joy, but fill it to the full. How? How do we do this as a congregation? Okay, keep it in mind. It's important for us as individuals to do this, but he's speaking to a church. He says this, Fulfill my joy, fill it to the full, by being like-minded... Focusing on what truly matters, having the same love, love everyone around you in the church family, even with those that it's hard to get along with. Hey, listen, the Philippians were a thriving church, but guess what? They were struggling to be unified. They were struggling, and hey, no church is perfect. Read Revelation 2 and 3, right? Be like-minded. Have the same love for one another. Be of one accord, of one mind. That just means be united. Have the same goals. Have the same game plan. You're partners in getting out the gospel. You're partners. You're partners with me. You're partners with God. You've got communion, fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God. You've, God's made you a partner you're not on your own getting the word out, though sometimes you are, but you've got other people encouraging you. In fact, Jesus, who's encouraging us to go into all the world and make disciples. And in verse 3, Paul continues to paint this beautiful portrait. And I put it on the screen in a little different way so you get the contrast. He says there, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Nothing. Church family, don't do anything in that way, don't be selfish. Don't be arrogant. But, there's the contrast. He's going to have one thing here and another thing here. But in lowliness of mind, with humility, you and I need humility. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others. Let each consider or regard those around them better, more important, more valuable Above, the word literally is above, regard everyone around you 
as more important and more valuable than yourself. Whew. Those are tall words, everybody. Verse 4, he continues. Let each, another contrast, let each of you look out not, notice this word, only, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, okay, we need, notice, he says only, but in contrast also for the interests of others. We all have things that we have to deal with on a personal level. We can't say, well, I'm never going to think about myself, and suddenly your beard is down to your belt. By the way, I, I had some classmates, man. I always just would, would look at those guys. I don't think I started shaving, Brother Jim, until I was like 34. But anyway, I remember this one guy in one of my classes. Oh, my goodness. His beard was like down to here. And that guy was only like five foot two. But what an amazing scholar he was. And his beard was perfect. I mean, I don't know what he did with it, but it looked like a woman's hair. You know, most beers, they're going all over the place. His was so perfect, and I just sat there. And the guy, he was, you know, working on a PhD, and he's got six children. I'm just thinking, perfect beard, wife, and six children. How does that compute? How does he do it? Because <laughs> that beard had to take two hours a day. But anyway... He had things to deal with, and so do we. So here's the thing. Paul doesn't say, hey, just let everything go. Grow your beard out. Let your hair turn in like Tom Hanks and uh, cast away. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to say Forrest Gump. Oh, he did it in Forrest Gump when he was running. Yeah, that, yeah. So that's not what Paul, he's saying, listen, we all have to deal with the, the home and different issues and all the things. We got to deal with them. Yesterday, our heating element went out on our Dryer. So I have the glorious job one night this week between 7 o'clock p.m. and 10 o'clock of taking the dryer apart, taking the drum out, taking the heating element off, unplugging all the wires going into the heating element, sticking the new one in there, plugging it back in, putting the drum back on, putting the pulley back on the uh, belt, and then putting all the screws back in, and then pushing the button and hope that I was making a a correct guess that it was the heating element. I figured that it wasn't heating up, so it's most likely if you know anything other on dryers, please come and let me know after the service. I don't want to spend $137 on a heating element I don't need. Okay, enough said there. But anyway, we got to look at these things in our own lives, but Paul said, don't, don't only, oops, don't only look out for your own issues. You have to be looking out for the interests of others. You know, as, as Dan Highway was speaking with, to us earlier, I was just up there thinking and praying, man, I, I hope that God raises up a number of our men to say, you know what? I can invest some time out of my life to look out for the needs of others, to, to, to be a Gideon. If they go over to a high school in the area or go to a some activity going on in a park or whatever. All the different ways to, to hand out New Testaments. I want to do that. I want to be part of that. Man, there's so many ways to be a witness for Jesus. I like the words of Frank Craddock. He once said to a group of Christian leaders, he said this, he said, listen, to lay down my life for Christ to die for him, appears glorious. To pay the ultimate price of martyrdom, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. Craddock says, we think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a thousand dollar bill and slapping it on the table and saying, here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all to you. I'm going to die for you. I, I remember telling the Lord Jesus that myself after uh, I had uh, my brain tumor surgery in 2004. The first day that I could go out, five weeks, or four weeks, I had to stay homebound for four weeks before I could go out and about. But that first day I had freedom was the day the, the Passion of the Christ movie by Mel Gibson came out. And after I watched that, 
I'll never forget. I'll never forget it for my entire life because I made a vow to God. I said, Lord, if I ever get in a position that I have to lay down my life for you, Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. But you know what Frank or Fred Craddock's saying here? He's saying, you know what? That sounds glorious, doesn't it? And I meant it. I meant it, and I still mean it to this day. But you know what? It sounds glorious. But listen to what Fred Craddock said. He said, it's like throwing a $1,000 bill on the table. Here's my life. But he says, but the reality for most of us is that God sends us to the bank, and he has us cash in that $1,000 for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there. Listen to a neighbor's kid's troubles instead of uh, saying, get lost. Go to a committee meeting. Give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Usually, giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. So first, if we're going to be servants that God wants us to be, the servants God wants us to be, we're going to have to go beyond our focus on self and see how we can serve all those whom God puts around us. How can we lay down our lives in, the day, in our day-to-day -day lives for our spouses, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our neighbors, for our coworkers, whoever we possibly can, just be vessels of God's love, partners with God, partners with one another. You know what? God would turn our church upside down if we all began to put our heart and mind and soul in doing that very thing. When you start loving by this, Jesus said, will all people know that you are my disciples when you have love for one another? When they see that, they're going to say, wow. Hey, it happened in my life. When I saw the Bible college men that were training to be preachers having lunch outside the, the welding factory in Chicago after my first year in college, I was unsaved, and when I saw them begin to sing a cappella, 90 grown men. Here I am growing up and, you know, so ashamed whenever we were singing and stuff. You're like, blah, blah. you know, my dad and I were, we didn't sing, we just mumbled. Because we just wanted to get out of church so we could go watch football and baseball and hockey and all the things we love. When I saw them singing like that, I said, Lord, They've got something I don't have. Wow. Now, when we get to verse 5, our second and final point, Paul gives us the supreme example, the supreme portrait of someone who put the interests of others above their own. And that's lesson number two here. The example of the servant God wants us to be. The example of the capital S, Jesus. The example of the servant God wants us to be. This is in verses 2 through 11. In verse 5, Paul tells God's people this. He tells them, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? As a church family, as individuals, we're to have the same gracious mindset, thinking graciously toward others. Instead of cutting them down, instead of putting them down and saying, you know, get with the program. What's the matter with you? What's it? And having that kind of an attitude and gripey and complaining, you turn into, you have the mind of Jesus. You let his mind be in you, and you just begin to, by his power, by his grace, begin to say to others, how can I help you? How can I help you? Never thinking of yourself, not thinking about how tired you are, though we get awful tired. Having the same gracious mindset toward others as Jesus had towards you. Verse 6, 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The form. What does that mean? Jesus was in the form of God. Well, the Greek word here is a, is a word that you'll recognize. It's morphe. In English, we say, we're watching the movie, you know, the Avengers. Was Hulk in the Avengers? <laughs> I can't remember. But let's say he was. But anyway, you're watching a movie, and the Hulk, Bruce Banner, is that his name? Bruce Banner? The Hulk, he morphs before your very eyes. What does that mean? We know, we use that word. Well, did you see that dude? He just morphed into the Hulk. Okay, what does it mean, Grayson? Yeah, does he look the same? No, well, so he takes on a new what? Yeah, he look, takes on a new appearance. Okay? The form isn't saying he was God forever in eternity past in heaven and now he's going to quit being God. That's not form. Form, because later on it says he took on the form, morphe, of a servant, of a bond slave. He, he, the form is the outward appearance. In all eternity, Jesus wore the Shekinah glory. Now, <laughs> it gets complicated because God is invisible. <laughs> The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're invisible. But they still wore. They still wore. They could see one another. <laughs> they still wore the Shekinah glory, all of them. But Jesus did not think that the outward appearance he had, the Shekinah glory, that he had to have that forever. He said, you know what? I can do this. I can shed the outward appearance that God, that I've possessed as God for eternity, and I can take upon me the outward appearance of a bond slave. I can look just like an ordinary person. I don't consider this robbery. What does a robber do? He takes. He takes something to himself. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hold on to this like a robber hangs on to what he steals. He considered it not robbery to be equal with God, to look the same as God looked, okay? But he took upon him the form of a servant. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of that TV show. You ever watch it, Undercover Boss? It's been on for quite a while. But what happens in Undercover Boss, everybody? The big kahuna says, you know what? I'm going to grow my beard out and I'm going to get my hair dyed or whatever just so I don't look the same and I'm going to go to work as a peon. I'm going to take the lowest level job and I'm going to go into my company and I'm going to find out who's really cutting the mustard, who's really doing. I want to see what life is like as a lowly servant, as a lowly employee. This is exactly what this is talking about here. Jesus came to earth. He looked like a nobody. Remember Isaiah 53? There was nothing in him that we should desire him. When people looked at him, they said, man, that guy is handsome, man. Look at that hair. And No, never said it about him. He said, he just wasn't. God chose that. He, verse 7, made himself of no reputation, Okay, that's the divine kenosis in the Greek. He emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation means he emptied himself. Yeah. He gave up his glorious status, taking the outward appearance of a bondservant and coming, look at this, in the likeness of hu humans. He looks like a human being, an ordinary human being. Okay? And, verse 8, being found in appearance, oh, here it is again, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death. Oh, notice, he humbled himself. Oh, wait a minute, didn't Paul just say that we shouldn't be arrogant, we shouldn't be selfish, we should, with lowliness of mind? Yeah, because he's telling us how God is, how Jesus is. He humbled himself, he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So on the cross, Jesus 
puts the interests of others ahead of his own. He's the greatest example of servitude we could ever have and that we would ever be given. Jesus glorified God the Father on earth. He died a criminal's death. And because of that, what happens? This is fantastic. Because he lowered himself low, low, low. I'm not talking about the Kroger commercial, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm saying he lowered, he'd humbled himself down to the lowest instance of humanity. He, he became humiliated. They stripped his clothing off. They nailed him to a cross. They nailed him. They said he should die. He's a criminal. They treated him like a criminal, spit on him, whipped him, mocked him, put a crown of thorns on his head. Talk about humiliation. Talk about humbling yourself. But because he did that, God glorifies him in eternity by giving him the name that is above every name. He's giving him the world renowned, the universe renowned, as we shall see, things of heaven, things of earth, things under the earth. Verse 9, therefore, God, the Father, also has highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every, every, at the great white throne judgment, there won't be anybody that's standing there like this, before the Lord Jesus Christ. Before they're relegated to the lake of fire, there won't be anybody standing there like this. Every knee shall bow. Of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, human, angelic, demonic, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the future, all creation will confess Christ as Lord to the Father's glory. The one who was the ultimate example of self-sacrifice and service to others who died as a criminal will be vindicated. And God the Father will be glorified. The question for us, just before I give the final story, is this. Will God be glorified by our lives. Jesus glorified his father. He took on the form of a servant. Will we take on the form of a servant? Will we glorify God in that way? That little question right there, seven words, that little question is massive. It's gigantic. When the Titanic cra crashed into an iceberg, the ship's resources, light, electricity, heat, and so on, instantly were in danger of failing. However, the engineers who were in the engine room worked to supply electricity by keeping the engines and the generation, generators operational to ensure the survival of as many passengers as possible. If the lights and the electricity and the wireless telegraph that they had failed, the level of panic on that ship would have been, think about it, it was there for quite a few hours before it sunk. Think about if they didn't have lights. Think about all the chaos and everything that, that they're right. Listen, they're in the middle of a pitch black ocean. Now, I don't know if the moon was full. I know I've heard it. I don't, I can't recall. I've heard it said before whether the moon was full moon or half moon or no moon. <laughs> but nonetheless, it would have been so much more scarier and chaotic. They might not have been able to get the people on the lifeboats. If people couldn't see where they were going, now, of course, undoubtedly, they might have had lanterns. But nonetheless, you get the idea, right? But through the efforts of the engineers, deep, deep inside that boat, power was maintained for the telegraph until 10 minutes. They were tapping that Morse code and trying to get messages out, help us, save us, we're, 
they were going to 10 minutes before the boat sunk. And the lights continued, listen to this, the lights continued until two minutes before the ship sunk in totality. 1,517 people died on the Titanic, but guess what? The death toll would have been so much higher if it hadn't been for the efforts of those engineers. 25 engineers, 10 boiler makers, boiler makers, the ones stoking the boilers down there with coal, keeping the fires going, keeping things going. 35 men were lost down in the bell, uh, belly of that ship because they wouldn't, they wouldn't put themselves ahead of others. Not one of them survived the sinking. And you know, because of their great sacrifice for all those people that did survive, okay, hundreds and hundreds of people that did survive, Great Britain decided to make a monument to them. It's called the Memorial to the Engine Room Heroes of the Titanic. It was the first monument in Britain to depict, to depict the working man, the very first one in all the history of Great Britain. Well now, with that in mind, we come to our Lord's Supper, okay? Hopefully all of you have a, a, a cup with the wafer and the juice inside of it. And if you don't, uh, Jeff, can you kind of raise your hand if you need one? Maybe you just didn't get one, okay? Raise your hand and Jeff will help you with that. We're going to remember the Lord. It's on the front of our Lord's Supper table up here. Do this in remembrance of me. We're not doing this to have some kind of uh, uh, invisible grace infused to us or anything like that. We're doing this to bring glory to Jesus by obeying him. He didn't say do this so you can get into heaven. Do this so that you can have eternal life. Do this so that you'll uh, be with me forever in heaven and eternity. You know, he said do this in my memory. Don't forget. Don't forget the price I paid. Don't forget. I don't want you to ever forget what I did for you. I laid down my life so you could live forever and ever with me in heaven. I love 1 John 3.16. I can't think of a, well, there's many verses I could put up, but this is one of the top ones. Notice how John uses what Jesus did for us as a motivation for what we are to be and to do. Notice. Did I miss it? Oh, there it is. Thank God. Okay. By this, by this, by Jesus' life, his crucifixion, all that he did, his coming, his incarnation, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay? God, when he looks down at Ridge Point Fellowship, he wants to see us moving from being loners and people who draw a circle around ourselves with our lives and just say, me, myself, and I. You just want to be to yourself. You don't want to take part in Bible studies or in things like, you know, we need to move away from that because that's the way that we are as just as humans. That's, that's our natural human instinct. And I was the very same way. <laughs> you know what? When I got saved, listen. <laughs> I barely knew diddly squat. But you know what? I had been playing the guitar since I was 12. I was, nine, or I was 18 when I got saved. And so I said, okay, 
I got a guitar. I can play the guitar. I could teach kids songs about God. And so I went down to the youth center and some guy said, hey, what are you doing here? I said, well, the preacher is preaching. I should, I should help. I should do something. And I said, and that's what I told him. And he said, you're with me. And that was my great big friend, six foot four, Scott Reese. He's still going strong in the Chicago area with the homeless, with the downtrodden, the very place we started our kids' Bible clubs. But listen, I took that guitar. I learned upwards of a thousand verses, put them to music. And we would sing those songs and the kids would memorize scripture. By the way, I've got the majority of those verses still residing in my mind. Isn't that amazing? Here I am. I'm just a brand new Christian, but one song after another, I'm memorizing passages of scriptures, entire psalms put to music and, and taught. When I became a school teacher in, in Garland in 1983, I was teaching Bible, fifth grade through twelfth grade, every day of the week. Man, before we ever opened the Bible up, I said, hey, I'm going to help you memorize scriptures, and I began to play those songs for that. Now I know what's going to happen. You're going to come to me and say, now, hey, let's do that in Bible fellowship, man. I don't know. Okay, yeah, well, we could do that. It wouldn't, wouldn't take that long. You'd be, you'd be memorizing songs like that, I'll guarantee you. But nonetheless, everyone, um, we're going to take this little wafer. I praise God for Scott Reese and the sacrifices in his life. Pray for his wife, Lisa, right now. She's just her health is, uh, she had a seizure, she had a stroke not very many weeks ago, and she was doing so much better, but then it was going back to that, and, and you know, she's, she's uh, in, in, her, in her 50s, in her early 50s, I think. But nonetheless, we hold this wafer in our hands representing the body of Jesus, representing the scripture things that happened to him bodily, the things that he endured. In fact, for the whole time he was walking on earth, but especially the last week and the last days of his life where he was just utterly scorned and ridiculed and hated and, and beaten, beaten. Isaiah 53, his appearance was so marred that you could not tell that he was human. Think about that. He did that for you. Don't ever forget that. The night before Jesus was crucified, he took the bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take this, all of you, and eat this. This is my body, which is broken for you. Now, we take this purple liner here, and we peel it back carefully without dumping it all on our laps. I was thinking about maybe we could go back to having our church family pass these out where they take it out of the dish. <laughs> See, I, I trim my fingernails and I can't get it. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. Now just look at that for a moment. Because Jesus says, you're doing this in remembrance of me. You're remembering what I did for you. And of course, the, the cup represents his blood. Blood is what keeps us alive. We lose our blood, we lose life. But the blood of Jesus, that Jesus shed for me and you way back on Calvary, that blood covered our sins. The Lamb of God, verse 29 of John 1, behold the Lamb of God. Behold means look. Look, we're looking at Jesus right now, a symbol of him, a symbol of his life, the blood draining out, the blood going out of him, the blood being given for you and I so we could live eternally. 
Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. On the cross, Jesus removed the sins of every single human who ever has and ever will live. He took them away. You say, Pastor Bob, how could he have done that? Because there's so many people that don't believe that. They don't agree with that. And they maybe never will, and they'll end up in the lake of fire. The book of Revelation tells us the answer. It doesn't, well, let me say this. For John 1, it doesn't say, Behold the Lamb of God who potentially took away the sins of the world. He didn't say it was potential. He says, he takes away the sins of the world. Everyone who's ever lived. 1 John 2, 1, he is the satisfaction for our sins, not for our sins only, the sins of the whole world. So you say, well, then, if he's taken away all their sins, how come not everybody goes to heaven? How come not everybody's saved? How come not everybody's born again? How come we have Christ rejectors? Why? How's that? Because if you go to the book of Revelation, they're standing in Revelation 20 before the great white throne judgment. The books are open. Plural, books. That's got the sins of every unsafe person. Those sins. And then, another book is opened. Singular, the book of life. Whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who was cast into the lake of fire? Was it people uh, who hadn't had their sins atoned for? No, because Jesus atoned for the sins of the whole world. Well then, how come they're cast into the lake of fire? The Bible states it clearly, succinctly, clearly, and without ambiguity. Okay? Whoever's name was not found written in the book of life, they never believed in Jesus for eternal life, was cast into the lake of fire. Jesus cleared the way, he took their sins away, and he made every single human savable. But guess what? Some people don't want anything to do with it. I've met many, many, many in my lifetime. They say, I, I don't want to live with you people forever. Use people up in Chicago. I don't want to live with used people. <laughs> I want to live with my friends. And of course, God, who is perfectly just and perfectly holy, he allows that. He's made them savable. He's removed their sins, but they still lack eternal life. And Dan, that's why we have the Gideons. That's why we have missionaries. That's why we need to be a missionary, because we need to get the good news out. So let's do this, all right? Let's remember Jesus, and let's lift high our cups, because in a moment we're going to say next time with Christ, because that's what we want, man, maybe not here the next time we take this, but with Jesus in the kingdom, would that not be amazing? So let's, let me give you the scripture, and then we'll say next time with Christ. The night before Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the blood of the new covenant which is given for the sins of many, the whole world, <laughs> given for the sins of many, as often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Ready? Next time with Christ. And just before we go, let me pray, pray a prayer over you and your families, over your life, over your ministry, over your children, over your grandchildren, over your work, over your uh, marriage. Let me pray. I know every one of you, you could get up here and say, please pray for me about thus and such. So allow me, without knowing, in many cases, to pray. All right, let's pray. Father, now I lift my hands up to you and over your people. And Father, what a privilege it is to lift up prayer to the throne of God. 
Father, I ask in every way that this week we will let this mind be in us that is also in Christ Jesus. Lord, where people are struggling, give them freedom. Where people are hurting, give them healing, Lord. Where people are um, sad, give them encouragement. Lord, in all the things we face, Father, you are the answer. Our great God, our Father, and his Son, Lord, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Our God is the answer for everything. And Lord, I turn to you and ask that your blessings, your help, your strength, your grace would come down like a, uh, an ocean, like a torrential rain and fall on your people this week. May it be a glorious week. May you give us doors of utterance that we might speak your word boldly as we ought to speak, Father. Lord, for those who are struggling to do that, Give them encouragement in their innermost being. Help them not to be afraid. Help them to say to themselves, with God's help, I can do this. I can be a witness for Jesus. I can, I can put in a good word for him in the office. I can sing his praises at lunchtime. Father, let your resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead rest on your people. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said,